Okay, everyone, this is Lecture 5 for Online Criminology, our last video lecture of the semester. During this last week of class, I simply want to invite you to email me with any questions or concerns you might have about the final paper and to provide some further insight on the last concept we're dealing with, restorative justice. Restorative justice is more than just a concept. In my view, it's the basis of the emerging reform that is now underway in our criminal justice system. If you haven't already, now's a good time to get more acquainted with the idea of restorative justice in our learning materials, including the PowerPoint presentations I've developed on the subject. My interest in restorative justice goes back to 2002 when I first began looking into it during my first attempt to teach criminology when I was teaching in Utah and later in Oregon at the University of Portland where I taught as a visiting professor for two years. Here I got involved in a regional restorative justice forum working with mostly practitioners in the field who have been working on reforming their individual programs toward more community-based solutions to crime as opposed to incarceration strategies. Working with these groups was a real eye-opener for me and where I established my later interest in scholarship in this emerging philosophy of justice. Today at Milliken, I am conducting ongoing research on restorative justice programs in the Decatur area, such as the Macon County Teen Court Program, Probation Department, Adult Redeploy Illinois, and our Community Restorative Boards all of which employ restorative justice principles as the central feature of their programming. With restorative justice, there's no one right way to do it. It can be integrated into any program that attempts to reform criminals, juveniles, or adults. What's important in my view is the establishment of the core principles of restorative justice as a guiding philosophy of justice. In my research, which has also involved the creation of the only complete bibliography of every major study ever done on restorative justice in teen courts, I've seen how the ideas of restorative justice, which sound good philosophically, have now been evidenced by a growing body of research that demonstrates exactly how and why it is a more effective approach to dealing with crime than our traditional deterrence-based philosophy of justice which has led to our incarceration nation and recidivism rates approaching 90%, you know, meaning up to 90% of offenders entering the system will reoffend within, say, two years. If you dig deep into the research on restorative justice, what we see emerging are certain key variables that seem to predict successful outcomes more than others. Interestingly, it seems that a face-to-face -face apology is one of the big factors. That's to say, offenders are far less likely to reoffend if they have been brought together with the victim and other members of the community to talk about the crime and its effects on the victim, on the offender, and on the community. Sounds simple, right? How can something so simple be so much more effective than what we're currently doing? I'd say it's because it's focused on community and not the offender, him or herself. So this is why I've assigned that chapter from Block on community and why I've asked you to think about restorative justice in light of community policing strategies. Restorative justice is community justice, plain and simple. It means first realizing that any time a crime is committed, relationships are broken and in need of repair. Simply punishing an offender is not enough. The victim needs a chance to express how the crime affected him or her. The offender needs a chance to listen to that and to be given a chance to apologize and to be understood by the victim as a whole person, both good and bad, who made a mistake and who needs to take responsibility for repairing the damaged relationship. Repairing the relationship to both the offender and the community at large who also have a stake in this. One common charge against restorative justice is that it's too soft on offenders, that an apology just isn't enough punishment for a crime. It's a 
common misperception of restorative justice because oftentimes in the restorative justice process of mediated dialogue between victims, offenders, and the community, the outcome decision typically involves punishments in the form of restitution or reparations like community service and sometimes jail or prison time, depending on the crime committed. More importantly, the offender is required to take responsibility for their actions by genuinely understanding how the crime affected the victim and community, but also by accepting that they must find ways to repair that broken relationship. While the typical treatment of offenders, which is locking them up, might feel good to the community, getting their just desserts or whatever, if the offender hasn't accepted responsibility for all the damage done, what will that offender have learned once they leave the jail or prison and return to society? Like 99% of all offenders return to society after all. And restorative justice also takes the important step of providing closure for victims who all too often in the traditional courtroom setting are not given a chance to express their feelings, which might be rage, anger, disappointment, violation, shame. Directly, you know, to express these feelings directly to their offenders and to the community. In addition, the community is given a chance to voice concerns over the offense and to reconcile the need for community safety during these sessions. In this way, restorative justice is a far more holistic approach to a criminal offense involving victims, offenders, and the community in a process of restoration and resolution. Isn't that a far superior strategy for reducing crime in all our communities, even if it doesn't fully satisfy your personal need for revenge? By the way, one interesting finding that is beginning to emerge from the new scholarship and research on restorative justice is that it seems to be more effective with the most violent of offenses, such as rape and murder, for real. Today, we typically invoke restorative justice when working with nonviolent, less serious crimes like drug crimes or property crimes, vandalism, mostly with juveniles. The common wisdom is that restorative justice is not appropriate for more serious crimes because of the trauma induced on victims, like having to face a rapist face to face. But it's more important to remember that a central feature of restorative justice is that it must be voluntarily agreed to by both victims and offenders before any such meeting is held in the first place. If a victim isn't ready or willing, the mediation does not take place. Also, though, we know that sometimes the hard work of truly moving beyond victimization involves facing your demons. And that expression, facing your demons, on the transcript is a hyperlink to a really good video about a restorative justice um, event that took place in a murder case in New Zealand. It's worth checking out. As you'll see in my PowerPoint, restorative justice actually has a long history where indigenous peoples, the, like the Maori of New Zealand, the Native Americans of North America, and the South African Truth and Reconciliation Councils established by Nelson Mandela, have employed this justice philosophy with tremendous success and where other more contemporary societies like ours, including Canada and Great Britain, have well-established successful programs based on restorative justice as well. It's my sincere, it really is my sincere and strongest hope that you, as my students in this class, will come to appreciate this historic yet revolutionary approach to justice, to see outside the box of our knee-jerk, retributive approach to crime in the U.S., and to see the benefits of reforming our criminal justice system to include restorative justice as a guiding principle, a more holistic and effective approach to crime. For those of you who will enter careers in criminal justice, or who already are, I hope this lesson is a revelation for you, and that you integrate it into your work as professionals. It was Einstein, I think, who said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? Hard to argue with that logic, especially coming from our boy Einstein, right? Okay, enough rambling from me. Time to get to work on your final paper. Be sure to include restorative justice principles in any discussion of your own program, explaining in what ways or to what extent 
your program involves those principles or doesn't involve them. For example, if you decided to develop a hardcore boot camp style program that emphasizes physical punishment and doesn't focus on community ties, etc., that's fine, but be sure to defend why you chose not to integrate restorative justice principles. Remember, I'm grading you largely on your ethical reasoning, not whether I agree with your program or not. And be sure to email me if you're stuck at some point writing this up. I'm here, I'm around, I'm a real person. Uh, also note this is a short week and your final paper is due um, not too long from now. So check those due dates and, and understand that I'm way too busy this semester to accept late papers. I'm not going to be able to do much to work with you. So hopefully you're on schedule, you've been thinking about this all semester, and hopefully you've already begun it. Uh, okay, that's it for this video lecture, and this concludes all the video lectures for this class. Hope that they were useful. Please remember to give me some feedback on my student evaluation so I know whether or not this worked. This is my first video lecture attempt, so I'm kind of curious if you thought these video lectures were at all useful or if I'm wasting my time, if I should just stick to the transcript, or which one worked better, if you like working with them in tandem, how you use them. I'd really appreciate some feedback on these video lectures. Um, if you have time, please fill that out in your um, evaluation of me, okay? Uh, I will talk to you uh, during the last week of this class, or call me if you have questions. Happy to work with you. Talk to you later.